goodness. Um, you may have your seats. <laughs> I just want to give honor to God, to our amazing God. And I want to give honor and, and thanks to our, to our uh, lead pastors, our house leaders, PD and XO. Yes, yeah. And I want to give honor to Pastor Kevin, my spiritual father, whom I love so much. My husband, Jeff, in the back, production. Whoop, whoop. And my, and my family's here, my parents and my aunt. So hello. So happy to have you all. Yeah, yeah. All right. So who is excited to watch some football later today? Yeah, yeah. Okay, raise your hand if you like to watch football for the love of the game. You like to watch the talented athletes, the excitement. That's you. Raise your hand. Yeah, yeah. Okay, raise your hand if you're into football for the food. The snacks, the commercials, you have no idea what's going on, but you love to eat and you love to watch the commercials. If that's you, raise your hand. Yeah, you are my kind of people. I don't know a whole lot about football, so I had to go to Google University to learn some. And it was quite entertaining and it was quite impressive to watch the, or to read about these players, their talent on the field, their stats, went to the Hall of Fame, and then even off the field what they did, some um, some started nonprofit organizations, donated to charities. So they were talented on the field and they were so, they were such givers off the field. It's quite impressive. And so then I went down a rabbit hole because I found an article that was titled Wasted Talent in the NFL. And I was like, whew, that's harsh. Let me read about that. And I, so that, so that, that article that I found just really, just really gutted me. So I started reading it, and it was just face after face, and such judgment of, ooh, they could have been great. They could have been an all-time great. They could have been a Hall of Famer, but they wasted it. And there were, there were players that were kicked off of teams because they had anger management problems, drug addictions, arrests, and they lost it. And my heart just broke. So the title of my message today is called, Don't Waste It. Look at someone next to you and say, don't waste it. And you can do your finger like this, don't, don't waste it, don't waste it. So Jesus has something to say about talents, okay? So Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 through 30, for the sake of time, we're jumping right in, okay? So Jesus talks about this master who had to go on a journey. So he gives to his servants talents, each according to their ability, each according to their ability. So he gave to one five, he gave to another two and gave to another one. You could easily look at that and say, well, that's not fair. That's a different amount for each one, each to their own ability. So he goes off and the servants get to work. So the one that that was given five went to work and he made five more and then the one that that got two went to work and he made two more and the one that was given one buried it just buried it so the master comes back and he wants to know what did you do with what I gave you so the so the one that was given five and the one that was given two excitedly comes up and says master I used what you gave me and I made more so the one that had five said, here's my five more, here's 10. And the one that had two said, here's my two more, here's four. And he said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with little. I will make you, uh, I, I will set you with much. I will set you over with much. I can trust you. Come and share in your father's happiness. He was so happy. And the one with one said, I was afraid, so I buried it. But here's your one back. And he responds to him by saying, you wicked, lazy servant. And he actually took that talent away from him and gave it to the one with 10. So now this guy has nothing. He has nothing. He has nothing. So someone say, I have gifts and talents. I have gifts and talents. So you probably heard this parable many times over. But the point that I really want to make today is that if you value what God gave you, you'll use it. If you value what God gave you, you'll use it. And if you don't value it, you will knowingly or unknowingly waste it, and you're going to lose it. You're going to lose it. 
Okay, so here's how this applies to us. We don't have football talent, but we do have talents from God and gifts too. We have gifts too. You have talents, you have gifts. And what I had sensed from, 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 uh, from God as I was just talking to him about this message, he said, I am so happy with the talents and the gifts that I have given to everyone here. Talents to write books. Talents to write songs. Talents for higher education. Talents to lead people. Talents to go back to school. Talents to start businesses. Talents to do hair and nails. Some of y'all have had very talented people do your hair and nails because y'all look so good. Y'all look so good. Um, and we also have gifts. We have gifts to, to, uh, to prophesy. Gifts of healing. Gifts of encouragement. Gifts of words of knowledge. To speak in tongues. We have all of those gifts. And God wants us to use them. To use them. And here's why. Because the world needs it. The world needs what God gave you, and you are to share it with the world. And so whenever Jesus said that the master told the one that had the one, he said, you wicked, lazy servant, that is harsh, y'all, is harsh. But here's what God told me about it. He said, I gave those talents to the people to use. I gave that one talent for that man to use, and he buried it. He didn't share it. So when you don't share what God gave you, you're actually stealing from the people that need it. That is why he was so harsh when he said, you wicked, lazy servants. And we don't want to be wicked, lazy servants. So say, I'm going to use my gifts and my talents. Say, I'm going to use my gifts and my talents. Yes. And so we cannot impact the world if we bury it. But here's why we bury it. We don't want to, but we get stuck in our head. We believe lies. So we're going to tackle some lies today that the enemy uses to try to get you to bury your gifts and your talents. All right. So let's tackle the first lie, fear of failure. We are afraid that we're going to fail. And so we're stuck and we don't even do anything with our gifts and our talents. Okay, so maybe you're thinking, oh, I've tried before and I failed miserably and I am not going there again. Or you're like, I don't even know where to start. I'm afraid I'm going to fail. I don't want to mess up. I love God too much. I don't want to screw it up. Okay, so fail is an acronym for first attempt in learning. You are going to fail because you're trying. But, but failure is proof that you are using the gifts and talents God gave you. He doesn't expect you to get it right the first time. Okay, so we're going to have a little fun with this lesson, okay? We're going to do the wave. You ready? Okay, so each section of the room is going to be a letter. So y'all are F for fail. So, uh, sorry, uh, first, first. And then A, attempt. Failed there. <laughs> in. So y'all are I for in. And then y'all are learning. So we're going to wave as I point, and it's first attempt in learning. You ready? Okay, let's go. And then bring, like, stand up, bring the arms up high, okay? First attempt in learning. That's so good. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so good. Okay, so. Here's the thing about failure. Ride the wave. Ride the wave. Ride the wave. Ride the wave. Failure does not last forever. Just like the wave does not last forever. It comes and it goes. Get back up. If you're ever out in the ocean and you're walking and a wave that's like right here takes you out, you're like, how is that even possible? The wave was so small and it took me out. Stand back up. Because failure will do that to you sometimes. It seems so small. And you're like, where did that come from? And why did it knock me out? It doesn't matter. Get back up. Ride the wave. Ride the wave. All right. So here's, here's a truth for you. If you fail, it doesn't make you a failure. It doesn't make you a failure. It's just proof you are trying. So failure in the parable. It's quite possible that the one with the five and the two talents failed. We cannot expect them to be perfect. They probably made some mistakes. But Jesus doesn't mention their failure because it doesn't matter. The failure that mattered was the one who didn't even try. That's the failure that Jesus mentioned. That's the one that matters. 
Okay, so maybe, so back to the, back to the NFL players that wasted their talent. The thing is they used their talent though. That got them in the NFL. Did they really waste their talent? No, they made some massive mistakes, but that doesn't make them a massive mistake. So maybe just like those players, you've made some massive mistakes and you were let go from your job. You're fired. You feel like you lost everything. I just want to encourage you that Jesus will never release you. You're never released from the team. You have a chance and a chance and a chance and a chance. As long as you believe in Jesus and you're on team Jesus, you're always on the team. Always on the team. Also, Jesus isn't back yet. So you have time to bury whatever you may have buried. Pick it back up and start using it. Someone say, I will use my gifts and my talents. Okay, let's tackle the next slide. Doubt. Woo, I don't know if I'm able. I don't know if I can do it. Well, God gave you talents and gifts according to your ability. So you are able. You are able. You can do it. You can do it. Also, God believes in you. God has no doubt in you. And he believes that you can use it because he gave it to you in the first place. He didn't ask for you to prove if you were able. He knows you're able. He gave it to you according to your ability. And he believes in you. It's proof that he believes in you. All right. So here's how you can start using what God gave you. You can start by saying yes. Grab the playbook. Grab your Bible and use those truths to combat every lie, to tackle every lie that comes into your mind. Grab your team. Grab your church. Have them, have them hold you accountable, encourage you to keep going. Whenever life knocks you down, get right back up. Yep. And you just use those gifts and take one step at a time. The ball advances one yard at a time. Take one step at a time. Start writing one sentence in your book. Do one page of the application, one class at a time. One thing at a time. And be faithful and move forward. And you can do it. Yes, you can do it. Say, I will use my gifts and my talents. That's right. That's right. All right. Amen. Amen. seats. Good morning, God Chasers. First, I would like to give honor to God, who's ahead of my life. He's the author and the finisher of my faith. And to our great leaders of this great house, Pastor Dante Banks and First Lady Banks, XO, and all of you as well. Thank you. I want to thank you for this opportunity to stand before you to share some encouraging words on this Super Soul Sunday. Now, I need you to know this. It took a lot of super soul searching for me to get to this point. But I'm grateful to God for what he has poured into me to share with you. Today, my text will be coming from Joshua 1 and 9. I'll be reading from the Amplified Version. And as we all know, it's customary here at God Chasers. We stand for the reading of the word. Glory be to God. Joshua 1 and 9, and it reads, I have not commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified or dismayed, intimidated. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. May the Lord have a blessing to the readings of his words. You may have your seats. One of the most significant events that has ever happened in my life happened about Four years ago, I was selected to serve as an assistant football coach 
for age group of boys, seven to eight years old. Now, this wasn't just about football. The organization used sports as a tool to encourage the young men and build relationship with them, to letting them and letting them know that the community cared about their livelihood. Now, this particular season was a very challenging season due to injuries, kids feeling inadequate, and not even believing in themselves. Some of the most important things the coach staff, coaching staff believe would be vital to the young minds of our youth were to develop leadership principles like teamwork, dedication, commitment, and integrity. Listen to me again, church. Teamwork, dedication, commitment, and integrity. There was a game, and it was actually our championship game, where we made it thus far by the sheer desire to be great. The boys had decided to show the community that they had what it took to be champions. But at this game, the final game of the season, something shifted. During warm-ups, the kids noticed that their opponents across the field appeared double in their size. Kind of like the Giants in the Grape Series we just went through, church. At that point, the coaches denied the, the salt could see that a change of their facial expressions, a fire, the fire that the team had, had slowly began to dwindle. But with a little pep talk, little encouraging words, we were able to inspire them to take the field. Now, football is a game of four quarters. And in this game, some things go your way and some things do not. And I'm going to tell you, at this game, it did not. The boys were taking hits, church, and I'm talking, they were getting hit in the mouth. Watching their morale decrease was like watching a tire lose its air. They were deflated. At that time, the ref blew his whistle, and we knew it was halftime where we found ourselves down, defeated, and beaten. And just like any football team, some of y'all have been put in a place in your life where you feel down, beaten, and defeated. I am using this example of a football team I coach to highlight the boys' ability to overcome adversity on a field. Simply to show you that majority of the times we fall victim to the adversary's tricks, schemes, and lies. Because we believe not in what God has shown us, spoken to us, or revealed within us. But church, I'm here to tell you the devil is a lie. Somebody say, get back in the game. Somebody say, get back in the game. The first thing I want to let you know, that even though you may feel down, you may feel beaten, you may feel defeated, you must hold tight to the promises of God, that I am ahead and not the tail, that I'm above all and not beneath, that I have more than, I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. What then shall I say in response to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? But why should we get back in this game? We should get back in this game because we're blessed. We're blessed in the city. We're blessed in the field. We're blessed when we come. We're blessed when we go. God has promised you the victory. You must position your mind and meditate on every divine promise that God has bestowed upon us. It is time for Christians to start eliminating those false pretenses of our inadequacies. 
Getting back in the game only requires us to face those fears, trace them, erase them, and replace them with the love of God. When we can boldly say what God says, church, when we can boldly say what God says, we look at the devil and we tell him, you're not the boss of me yet. You're not the boss of me. Somebody say, get back in the game. Church, I don't know about you. Anything and everything God has promised me, I don't want some of it. I don't want half of it. I want all of what God has promised me. The battle, the game is a rigged, rig, church. It's a fixed fight. Somebody say, get back in the game. The second thing I want to let you know, that even though you may feel beaten, you may feel down and defeated, you must change your thought process. Changing your thought process tells you to get up and don't give up, that I'm well equipped to press forward. We cannot allow the wickedness in our lives to determine our outcome. We cannot allow the workings of the enemy to stop our success. I believe, church, I believe God will hold you in a situation until your spirit gains power over your flesh which will enable you to stand before that situation, that circumstance, and, and, and then step and, and say that I will never again allow a situation to hold me captive in the midst of confusion. We got to understand knowing that if God be for me, who can be against me? We got to understand knowing that the God I serve did not give me the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. We must stand knowing that I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Somebody say, get back in the game. Now, church, the last thing I want to let you know, that even though you may feel down, you may feel beaten, or you may feel defeated, you must encourage yourself. Did you know that testing of your faith produces perseverance? I'm going to say that again. Do you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance? Being knocked down is not the problem. It's staying down is. What we are, what we are not, what we are not above falling short or failing. The battle of the game is not lost when we fall. You just may need to reposition yourself and add a little get up in your spirit. Even if Pastor Dante can't be there for you, encourage yourself. Even if Pastor Tab can't be there for you, you need to encourage yourself. Even if Pastor Kev, Pastor Yvonne, and singing from the heavenly choir cannot be there for you, you still need to encourage yourself. Somebody say, get back in the game. All right, now let me finish my story. Before leaving the locker room, there arose a faint chant that started to grow among the players like the trumpets and the shouting that brought down the walls of Jericho, crying out, saying, Ready, be ready, Chill. be ready for y'all. Uh -huh. Be ready, be ready, be ready for y'all. Hey, 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 be ready, be ready, be ready for y'all. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Yes, yes, we're ready, we're ready. The kids begin to encourage themselves, bringing down the walls of intimidation. They realize that they deserve to be here, and even though they've fallen behind, they still deserve to rise again. The chant lit a fire amongst the team that I could not believe 
The look they displayed with determination began to spread like wildfire, church. Church, what I'm trying to get you to understand is not only did we get back up, but we stayed up. We, got, we came back with a fight and the determination to get us back in the game. And with that determination, we won the game. We stood victorious over our opponents who they looked somewhat bigger than us, somewhat qualified than us, and so much equipped than us. As I close, church, I come to encourage somebody. Hold on to, your, to the promise of God and get back in the game. Change your thought process and get back in the game. Encourage yourself and get back in the game. Don't give up and get back in the game. Sometimes when the world turns their back on you, don't get up in the game. You got to stand on the promises of God. I say you got to stand on the promises of God. It does not matter what you go through. It does not matter what you have to face. You got to stand. Stand on the promise. Stand on the word. Stand and trust him. Stand and believe him. Understand that God loves you. And get back in the game. Thank you. to God. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Giving honor to God, my amazing pastors, PD and XO. Don't we have the best pastors in the planet? My co-laborers in ministry, Charisma, where are you at? And all of you in church and watching online, my family joining us online, good morning. Feels so good to stand before you guys today. I got time running on the clock, so um, we're going to get this started. You ready? So today I'll be talking to you about it taking a team. I'm going to give you the cliff notes real quick. It is ministry. The team, look around. That's us. Okay? Please stand for the reading of God's holy word found in 1 Corinthians 12, 27 through 31, and it reads, you are Christ's body. That's who you are. You must never forget this. Only as you accept your part of that body does your part mean anything. Now I need you guys to read it with me. You ready? Let's read it one more time. You are Christ's body. That's who you are. Turn to your neighbor. You, 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 you. You must never forget this. Only as you accept your part of that body does your part mean anything. Go ahead and take your seats. We're going to have some fun this morning. So we are the body. We are all, thank you, Ducey. Ducey's my amen corner this morning. Thank you, Ducey. We all have parts, so I'm going to just give you a crash course in 1 Corinthians. Paul is talking to a divided church, and he is trying to ignite a fire in them with the analogy of the body. A hand is necessary, eyes are necessary, a mouth is necessary, a nose is necessary. They're all different, they have different functions, but they're needed. You are eyes, you are noses, you are hands. You are part of the body. You are part of the team. So as we examine, as we prepare for Super Bowl Sunday, we're going to talk about teams. All right, Corinne. First team, Seattle Seahawks. Now, 10 division titles, two conference championships, one Super Bowl. Guys, I'm not an expert on football. I eat the snacks and watch the commercials. My dad helped me with this. <laughs> but the Seattle Seahawks, when you think about this team, when they talk about the team, they talk about the team coming together and winning. So it took a group of qualified players, a team, to win that championship. Next slide. Dallas Cowboys. And so look at the record.
record. You see the record. You see the record. Now look, obviously, I got on a Dallas jersey. I come from a cowboy family. But let's be real, they hadn't won a Super Bowl since I was a freshman in college. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you ask any Dallas Cowboy fan at the beginning of the season, what do you hear? This is our year. Dallas may not be known for winning any Super Bowls in the 2000s, <laughs> but what they are known for is consecutively packing the stands of their football arena. Why? Because they have faithful fans. The New England Patriots, who have been known as a dominating force in football, but when they talk about the New England Patriots and their dynasty between 2001 and 2019, it's called the Belichick Brady era. They highlighted a phenomenal coach and a star player, not the whole team. So I've given you three examples. One, of a team that won together. Two, of a team that hadn't won in over 20 years, but they have amazing fans. And number three, an exemplar coach and player. These are the components of a team. A team has an owner, a coach, players, and fans. Next slide. Now, I didn't say the owner was always good in football. But here's what owners do. They construct teams, they, cre they create and cultivate the culture of the entire organization. They carry the cost of the wins and the losses. Why? Because they created the team. Next slide. The coach. The coach prepares the game plan, puts the players in their proper place, pumps up and pushes the team, pulls out the strengths of the team, and prospects new talent. The players. The players play their specific position. They practice and perform according to the playbook. They partner with their teammates. They're personally invested in the team's success because there are a lot of benefits to being a good player. And last but not least are us fans, us fickle little fans. We sit on the sidelines and watch the team take all the hits. We criticize the team without having put in the time, the prep work, the practice, or contributing to the outcome of the game. And we love our team until we experience lots of losses. So let's consider Team GC3. Who is our owner? He's our Heavenly Father. He put us all together for a purpose. No one is here by accident. His powerful presence creates the atmosphere that we operate in. He paid the cost. And in the end, that payment guarantees us victory. Genesis 1 and 1 says, God created the team. The coaches. Oh, we got some phenomenal coaches in GC3. They prepare the game plan by setting the brilliant and bold vision in the house. They put all the players and the pieces in place. They pump us up each week through the preach word. They pray over our problems. They push us towards our purpose. They pull out our strengths. Jeremiah 3 and 11 says, our coaches, our shepherds, after God's own heart. PD and XO, our coaches and shepherds, after God's own heart. But GC3, examine yourself, family. Are you a fan or are you a player? See, players in ministry, they play their specific parts and are always in position. They practice and perform according to the playbook, the holy word. They partner with their teammates to serve the people. They pursue their purpose both individually and collectively, and they personally invest their time, their tithe, and their talent. 1 Corinthians 15 and 58. 58 says, be steadfast, immovable, changing abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, your labor is never in vain. 
But are you a fan? Could you be a fan of GC3? Let me tell you what some fans do. They show up to support only when they feel like it. Some sit on the sidelines with God-given gifts that could help their team in ministry. Some criticize their team without setting foot in the field to contribute or serve. Some don't commit at all and constantly court other teams, better known as jumping on the bandwagon. Some only love their team when they are winning. But, but let the lack of discipline, division, disappointment, and disagreement come, and they allow that to disconnect them from not only the owner, the playbook, but also the team. James 1.22 says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. That is challenging you to work. So here's my testimony. I was a fan. I was in transition towards the beginning of the year and I watched GC3 online. I was dealing with some hurt and some disappointment. And it took me four months to join the house. Oh, but when I did, I realized that this was good ground to grow in, a good field to sow in, and I had to serve. And I haven't stopped yet. You may start out like a spectating fan, like I did, watching and cheering, but the goal is for you to become an active player, serving and giving. GC3, the work of the ministry takes a team. Turn to your neighbor and say, it takes a team. That team consists of not just XO and PD, but you, 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 and me. Our owner, our heavenly father designed each of you with a gift. There is a gap that you are supposed to fill. We need more players. We have an amazing team, but we can't do this work alone. The field is too big, and there are too many super souls that need to be saved. Plus, God is doing great things at God Chasers. Last week, PD talked about us relocating, recruiting through outreach, becoming a food distribution site. If you can smile, you can greet. If you like kids or working with kids, we got G-Kids right across the hall. If you, if you know how to work with tech, we got a tech team that could use you. If you know how to sing, we got a praise team that could use you. If you know how to put food in a box, we got GC3 Cares that could use you. The good thing about the field of ministry is that the outcome of the game is already predetermined. We win in the end. Our MVP, Jesus Christ, fixed the game and bought it with a price, his precious life. Team, it's time to accept your part. I take you back to our verse. You are Christ's body. That's who you are. You must never forget this. Only as you accept your part of that body does your part mean anything. Family, examine your hearts today. Consult the playbook. You are needed. You are necessary. Get off the bench and join the team. I love you. I love you. Thank you. opportunity to come before you all and encourage you in the Lord today. Hallelujah. And the angels of this house, we've already given them honor, but just clap for them real quick. Our pastors. Hallelujah. Thank y'all. Thank y'all for trusting me. Hallelujah. We're going to dive right on in y'all. All right. All right. Um, let's go to our scripture. We're going to come from first Peter verse five, eight through 11. All right. Are we ready? 
It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same suffering are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace who called, you, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you to him. Be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God for his word. Thank you, Lord. So we're going to come today. Uh, the title of my text is Run to Win. Run to Win. All right. So uh, the reason that um, I, I selected this, this topic to speak about is because I have noticed as of late, as may you have, that the, the enemy, he's really running rampant, and he's playing tricks. He's, he's deceiving the minds of the body of Christ. He's wreaking havoc. You know, we're falling into de depression, uh, suicide. We see pastors committing suicide. We see people in, in places of ministry that are quitting, quitting the assignment. They, don't know, they no longer want to do this because the adversary has convinced them that they are not going to win and that they will die. Hallelujah. So it is the enemy's, uh, his mission to distract us from the goal. He's looking to kill your dreams. He's looking to kill your drive and your ambition. And he's on a mission to steal your peace of mind. All right? Steal your joy and to devour your finances even. All right? So what I want to do is give you all some tools and give you an acronym. And hopefully it impresses upon your heart. And the acronym is going to be for the word RUN. Right? Because we're going to run to win. All right? So let's just go right in. Let's start with the letter R. All right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we are going to respond with the word. Amen? We're going to respond with the word. In order to run to win, you must respond with the word. The word of God tells us in Ephesians 6, um, we know about putting on the whole armor of God, right? Right, right down around along verse 17, uh, it talks about uh, taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And if you are familiar with scripture, when Jesus uh, was tempted by the enemy, the enemy would come and try and tempt Jesus, right? With all kind of lies, he would come to him with twisted scriptures. And Jesus was like, uh-uh, player, that's not the word. I know the word. I am the word. <laughs> that's not the word. And, and, and Jesus would, would uh, speak the scripture in proper context. And the enemy had no other choice but to leave, right? He had to go. He had to go because he could not stand up against the word of God. Hallelujah. And that's why it's so important for us that we study to show ourselves approved, right? And that we rightly divide the word of truth so that we have that weapon, which is the word to combat the enemy and his lies, right? All right. You know, the enemy, he's not trying to play fair. He's not playing fair, okay? And he's pulling out all the stops to try and get us to quit and abort the assignment. But we have the word of God, and hopefully it's hidden in your heart. And if not, it's not too late to begin to indulge yourself in the word of God and hide it in your heart so that it's available to you when those moments come from the enemy, when he's coming from every side. You'll be able to recall the word of God from your belly, hallelujah, and you'll be able to put him in his place. You can see him for who he is, and he's a lie. So if he's coming with anything contrary to the word of God, you'll be able to pull up the word of God and say, not so. The word says, Woo. <laughs> hallelujah. And he's got to go. He's got to go. Yes, God. So the word says over in Psalm Psalm 147 and 15, it says that he sends out his command to the earth and his word runs swiftly. His word runs swiftly. So, and we know that God operates outside of time, right? So does his word. So when his word is sent out, it's already fighting for us. It's already preparing that place of victory for us. Hallelujah. And we know that his word, it doesn't return void and it'll never return to him empty. It will accomplish exactly what it sets out to. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we're going to respond with the word. Amen. Let's go to you. All right. In order to run to win, 
you have to have an undignified worship. Undignified worship. Listen, he desires to commune with you, right? And worship, it should be purposeful. It's a purposeful and intention elevation of God above everything else. <laughs> so we know our example, uh, David. You know, from an early age, David understood the importance of having a close relationship with God. All right. He was a man after God's own heart. OK, he was passionate. He was unapologetic. He was unashamed. He had a laser focus. He was a worshiper to the very core. It didn't matter where he was. It didn't matter what he was facing. He knew that if he just worshiped, <laughs> if he just worshiped, things would have to change. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And even when people called his personal expression of worship, they called it vulgar, right? They said it was vulgar. You don't, you don't take all of that. He said, oh, guess what? Guess what? Guess what? I will celebrate before the Lord, and I'll become even more undignified than this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can recall and remember when people used to tell me, Tiffany, don't take all that. Why are you always up there sweating out your hair and your makeup? Why are you always hollering? Why is there always such an urgency when you worship? I said, oh, you don't understand that in the midnight hour, those times where I had to cry out to God, I had to come from a place of desperation. And all that I could do was say, God, you are good and you are good to all. You are worthy of glory. You are worthy of honor. I don't understand my situation right now but I understand that you are good and you are good to all I don't understand why things are happening this way I don't understand why I'm sick in my body but I understand that you are good and it is your desire that I shall live and not die hallelujah that you will satisfy me with long life hallelujah so that is the reason that I have to worship the way that I do. That's why it's so intense. That's why there's such an urgency because I understand that when I worship, heaven has to respond. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, y'all. Let's go. Let's go to the end. Let's go to the end. In order to run to win, you can never stop praying. Never stop praying. Matthew 26 and 41 says that we should watch and pray. It tells us to watch and pray. Hallelujah. It means that we have to be awake, sober, diligent, and on guard always. And that enables us to see the enemy when he's at the door desiring to entrap you. Hallelujah. Prayer is a powerful, but it's often the most neglected weapon that we have. Hallelujah. In our awesome, we ought, to, we ought to commune with God so frequently in prayer that we're able to discern the plans of the enemy before he can even execute. We ought to be so close to God in prayer that we can hear and, and, and mimic and be on pace with his heartbeat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But you can't watch if you're distracted and have your eyes fixed on the things of the world. And you can't pray effectively if you don't know the word of God. Listen, when we pray, we align ourselves with God's will. And so we have to stay in prayer for each other. And if we intercede and pray in agreement with each other on a matter, it produces even a greater power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And I have one more end for you. It's just another little, little side note. I mean, I do know how to spell run, but we're going to add an extra end to it. And that's the name of Jesus. We have the name of Jesus. We have the name of Jesus. Every religion has a God. They have an object of worship, right? They have a little G-O-D, and they, they have lords and all of this. But there's, and it can be used in many different contexts. But there's only one context that you can use the name of Jesus. And there's only one name, Jesus. And God said that he exalted that name higher than every other name. That at the name of Jesus, that every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Use your weapon. The name of Jesus. In John 1.1, 1, 1, it teaches us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Hallelujah. The Word has a name. That name is Jesus. That name is Jesus. So when you're responding with the Word, you're responding with the name of Jesus. And the enemy cannot stand against that great name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 
Let me close real quick. I know it's Super Bowl Sunday, so we'll talk a little bit about football. So listen, the enemy, he has watched the film session on the patterns of your past, and he knows your weaknesses. He knows that God has blessed you. He knows that you're running with the blessing, that you're running with the anointing, that you're running with the power of God, and he's trying to take that power from you so that you, you die before you complete the assignment. Hallelujah. You must know that you've been given the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt hurt you hallelujah thank you jesus thank you jesus one last thing y'all uh, one last thing y'all i want to encourage y'all some of us are right on that, that 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 point of crossing the gold line right hallelujah and you know you're gonna have to go through the enemy's camp sometime in order to break through the, that that gold line and cross over in that gold line and i learned thank you google about a power run in the nfl a power play a little bit about a power play a power run it says uh, you have to bring in some bodies for a party uh, a, a, a power run right you got to bring in some bodies with some weight on them okay um usually it's like uh, two offensive linemen if I, if I understand correctly right and as my pastor pointed out you need somebody that can take the hit for you well, hallelujah come on now so get you an intercessor get you a worshiper get you a pastor get you a preacher somebody that can declare the word and push you over the goal line hallelujah thank you jesus somebody say run to win, run to win. say run to, win. run to win say i'm going to respond with the word i'm going to offer up an undignified worship and i'm going to never stop praying run to win run to win